Well, good morning, everybody. May I add my welcome to Luke's? My name's Campbell Paston. I help to lead the fellowship groups here um, at All Souls. And uh, may I apologize this morning that it is freezing in here. Um, if you're visiting and you're not from the UK, you may have thought that the weather was going to get warmer, but this is kind of what happens. Although this is authentic Anglicanism as well. So if you're visiting, you're really getting a sense of what the true Church of England is like, which is shivering on a Sunday morning in a very cold building. But that's good because it means that the only thing that's warming us is the word of the Lord. So let's make a start. <clears throat> oh, that I had someone to hear me. I sign now my defense. Let the Almighty answer me. Let my accuser put his indictment in writing. Surely I would wear it on my crown. I would put it on, on my shoulder. I would put it on like a crown. That was how Job's final speech ended in chapter 31 last week. Job began the book as a blameless man who feared God and turned away from evil. But God allowed him to face terrible suffering and he had no idea why. For chapters and chapters, he's been going round in circles with his friends Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And they've been trying to figure out what is going on. His friends have said, well, God is always in the right. So if Job is suffering, it must be because he's in the wrong and he sinned. But Job was convinced that he was in the right and therefore wondering if God is the one who's in the wrong. Ultimately, none of them can find out the answers to what is going on. True wisdom remains elusive. All that we have is what God has revealed to us, which is to fear him and turn away from evil. That is wisdom. But we don't know anything more. That was the conclusion of where we reached last week. And so Job finishes off his speech by saying, well, let the Almighty answer me. And this book has been written deliberately so that we're right there with Job at this point. We want God to turn up. Perhaps um, you're here today as someone who's been wrestling with an area of suffering yourself. And you feel like Job is voicing your own thoughts. It's about time that God turned up and said something. The book works a little bit like a pressure cooker building up steam. Um, do go back and have a read of the chapters that we've had to skip over to feel the full effects of it. When we get to chapter 31, we're thinking, come on, God, surely it's time that you turned up and justified yourself for everything. Explain to Job what's going on. Tell him about the scene that we got to see in chapters 1 and 2 with the heavenly courtroom and the challenge that Satan made. And then come and explain to us all of the questions that we have as well. And this is the week that finally God does appear on the scene. But we're going to have to wait just a little bit longer because there's a surprise in chapter 32. Instead of God, somebody else chips in first instead, a young upstart called Elihu, who we discovered has been lurking in the background throughout all of this. So have a flick back in your Bibles, back to page 533. And we're actually going to start in chapter 32 this morning. Chapter 32, verse 1. So these three men, that is um, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, Job's friends, stopped answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. But Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzite of the family of Ram, became very angry with Job for justifying himself rather than God. He was also angry with the three friends because they found no way to refute Job and yet had condemned him. Now Elihu had waited before speaking to Job because they were older than he. But when he saw that the three men had nothing more to say, his anger was aroused. Now, it's very tempting to skip over Elihu when teaching through the book of Job because he sort of gets in the way a little bit. We want to get to what God has to say. Uh, it's a little bit like in an important um, boardroom meeting when everybody's looking to the CEO to give an important steer. Nobody wants Hubert, the recent grad student, to chip in and give his opinions on what's going on. But that might be the point of why Elihu is here because really what needs to happen is that Job and his friends need to start again to look at things with fresh eyes. And maybe, ironically, Elihu, the young man, can see something that the old wise men can't. 
A couple of weeks ago, I suggested that um, reading through the book of Job is a little bit like um, I'm trying to make sense of his suffering. It's a little bit like walking a tightrope between two wrong options. And Elihu can see this. On the one hand, he burns with anger with Job because Job keeps justifying himself rather than God. Job is in danger of falling off the left-hand side of the tightrope. But on the other hand, he burns with anger with the friends because they keep condemning Job, even though they can't refute what he's saying. They're at risk of falling off the right-hand side. And Elihu gets the tightrope problem. He can see that there has to be a way of staying on the tightrope without falling off either side. To extend the metaphor a little bit more, he's looking for what, what is the bar or the pole that you have to hold on to to stay upright on the tightrope. Now, Elihu is not a straightforward uh, character at all, and, and we'll deal with his speech only very briefly. But one of the points that he does raise is that maybe the way to stay upright on the tightrope is to stand back and consider who God really is. So have a flick forward to chapter 37, which is on page um, the second half of chapter 37, which is on page 538, verse 21. Elihu says, this is at the end of his speech, now no one can look at the sun Bright as it is in the skies after the wind has swept them clean. Out of the north he comes in golden splendor. God comes in awesome majesty. The Almighty is beyond our reach and exalted in power. In his justice and great righteousness he does not oppress. Therefore people revere him. For he, does he not have regard for all the wise in heart? Do you see what Elihu is suggesting here. Part of the problem of the whole discussion between Job and his friends is that there is a danger that they are reducing God down to human size. Even the way that I've drawn the diagram um, makes it look a little bit like it's Job versus God, as if God and Job are two men who are working out a disagreement together. But Elihu's point is that trying to even look at God and understand him is a little bit like trying to look at the sun. The sun is so overwhelmingly dazzling. And that's what God is like, says Elihu. He is beyond our reach and exalted in power. When you start to consider who God really is, he's so dazzling that you can only get so far before you have to turn away. Well, at the end of chapter 31, we were all ready for God to step on the scene and give an account for himself to explain to Job what's been going on. But Elihu casts a note of doubt upon it all. Is it really possible to face up to God like that? Or is that a little bit like trying to face up to the sun? At which point, finally, God steps on the scene. And we get to chapter 38, which we had read to us. And here comes the great twist in all of this. Because when God finally appears, he is the one Asking the questions, not answering the questions. Have a look back at chapter 38, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to God, to Job, out of the storm, and he said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. And what follows is a long speech from God, but not one where he answers Job's questions, rather one where he interrogates Job. Verse 4, where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimension? Surely you know. You don't know. Oh, okay. okay, then. Well, how about this one? Verse 12, have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place? Surely there's been at least one day when you commanded the morning and told the dawn to get started. Really, there hasn't been a single day. Okay, well, well, let's try another one, shall we? Verse 19. What is the way to the abode of light, and where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths to their dwellings? Surely you know, for you were already born. You have lived so many years. You've been alive for a while, Job. This one must be an easy one for you. Not this one either. And so on and so on for question after question. Have you entered the storehouses of snow? 
What is the way to the place where the lightning is dispersed? Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades? Can you loosen Orion's belt? Can you raise your voice to the clouds and cover yourself with a flood of water? Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do they report to you and say, here we are? Until finally, in chapter 40, verse 2, God says to Job, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. Now, God isn't being condescending to Job here. His point is that Job is challenging one who is so far beyond his comprehension that it starts to seem slightly ludicrous when you put it into perspective. Has Job ever given orders to the morning? Has he ever told the dawn to begin? Give it a try tomorrow morning. Have a go at waking up when it's still dark and telling the dawn to begin. I can lend you my two-year-old daughter if you have a little difficulty getting up when it's still dark. I'm perfectly happy to do that. Give it a try. Or does Job send the lightning bolts on their way? Again, next time you're in a lightning storm, try going outside, standing on the top of a tall building. Have a go at directing the lightning bolts and seeing if you can get them to go where you want them to go. Well, the one that Job is contending with is the one who can do that. He is trying to question him, but without any real understanding of who God is and how he runs the world. Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? But God isn't finished at this point. Just as Job faced two rounds of suffering at the start of the book, and we might be expecting two rounds of God justifying himself at the end of the book to match it, actually what we get is two rounds of God asking the questions. And so in chapter 41, again, God tells Job to dress like a man while he asks him questions. This time, God's challenge to him comes in chapter 40, verse 9. Do you have an arm like God's? And can your voice thunder like his? Are you strong enough to take on God? And what God does is to illustrate this question in chapters 40 and 41 um, with two great creatures that he has made, the behemoth and the leviathan. Let's just read a little bit about what he says about the leviathan in chapter 41. So skip over the page. This is chapter 41, verses 1 to 5. Can you pull in Leviathan with a fish hook or tie down its tongue with a rope? Can you put a cord through its nose or pierce its jaw with a hook? Will it keep begging you for mercy? Will you speak? Will it, will it speak to you with gentle words? Will it make an agreement with you for you to take it as your slave for life? Can you make a pet of it like a bird or put it on a leash for the young woman in your house? Everyone in Job's day knew that there were creatures lurking in the depths of the sea that nobody could contend with, so vast and mighty that you'd be lucky to get away with your life if you met one. Now, the point here isn't to speculate about exactly what creature God is talking about, although if it helps, you could think of a giant squid or a killer whale, perhaps. The point is, is that the sea is full of leviathan-like creatures. And God asks Job, well, can you fish one up? Can you get a giant squid on a hook? Can you get a killer whale to beg for mercy? Can you put a leash around a great white shark and stick it in a goldfish bowl as a pet? These are terrifying creatures. There is no way that you would take one on. And God's point is, well, if you wouldn't dare take on Leviathan, what makes you think you can take on me? Verse 10. No one is fierce enough to rouse Leviathan. Who then is able to stand against me? who has a claim against me that I must pay. Everything under heaven belongs to me. Do you see the twist in the book? For chapters and chapters, we probably felt more and more like God needs to step on the scene and justify himself to answer Job's questions, to answer our questions. Really? Did we think for a second that God was going to be the one answering the questions? That he was going to be in the dock, so to speak? No, God isn't accountable to man. It's the other way around. Or did we forget that? Did we think that we had understanding to take him on when we've never once had to try and make the sun rise in the morning? Did we think that we had the strength to take him on when we would never dare wrestle a killer whale? And this is the answer that is right at the heart of the book. 
So if you've nodded off, now is the moment to pay attention because this is what we've been working towards for four weeks. We're supposed to get to chapter 38, ready to give God a grilling. And instead what happens is that we're blown away as God steps on the scene and asks the questions and invites us to consider who he really is. This is not just another person that we're contending with. This is the Lord God Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. Out of the north he comes in golden splendor. God comes in awesome majesty. That was the end of Elihu's speech. I wonder if you've come across uh, this photograph before. Um, It's called Pale Blue Dot, and it's a photograph of the Earth taken from a distance of about uh, 6 billion kilometers away by the Voyager 1 space probe in 1990. And you can just about make out on it a tiny little dot in a sunbeam, which is our which is our earth. Um, In fact, if you can't, I've circled it in red there. There it is. (laughs) This is God's vantage point over everything. We may live in a culture that likes to haul its leaders into the dock. Remember Partygate? That was happening um, about a year ago, this time last year. But with God, it is different. God does not explain himself to us. It's the other way around. The point of the book of Job is to realize who he really is. And after God finishes his speech to Job, Job speaks one more time. Look ahead to chapter 42. Chapter 42, verse 2, Job says, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And again, there's a clever twist going on here, because back in chapter 19, Job had said, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end... He will stand on the earth, and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. Job knew that God would sort everything out in the end, but Job expected that he would only see God in that sense on the last day. But look at what Job says in his final speech. Now my eyes have seen you. Does that mean that Job has the answers to his questions? No. Does it mean that all the pain and frustration has all just magically gone away? No, it doesn't. No, nothing's changed. Job is still sitting in ashes at this point. But the point is is that now he has seen God for who he really is. And he despises himself. And he repents in dust and ashes. Not because he wasn't innocent after all. Remember, we spent chapters and chapters showing that Job hadn't sinned to cause his suffering at the start. The friends were wrong about that. But rather, he repents of his demand to give, that God give him an explanation. He changes his mind about that, which is what repentance means. Now, the book doesn't end here, as we'll see in a minute. God does actually restore all of Job's fortunes at the end of this. But that's not the moment when Job sees God for who he really is. It isn't after his life has been made nice again. It's when he finally grasps that God is not just another man. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. The one who can tell the dawn to start. The one who can put a hook in Leviathan's nose. And that happens when he's still in the midst of suffering and without all his questions answered. So here's a suggestion. The next time you feel particularly aggrieved by something in your life that you know that God could have done something about, I don't know what it is for you. Perhaps it's a great injustice at the global scale, the the war in Ukraine that just drags on and on, recent earthquake, or maybe it's something going on in your own life or the life of a loved one, or maybe it's just an existential question that would give you so much relief if God were to answer it clearly. Personally, I found the book of Job very helpful, not just in dealing with suffering, but a whole range of existential questions that cause me doubt and anxiety. Whatever it is, when you're burning with frustration towards God and you're full of questions like Job is, and you really feel like God needs to step up and justify himself, Well, here's a suggestion. Try getting up early on a clear morning and watching the sun rise 
and carry on watching it until the sun is too bright and you can't watch any longer, which doesn't take very long. And as it's rising, think to yourself, the one that I'm contending with is the one who is telling the sun to do that. He is the one who designed it so that it should happen, and he is the one who has authority to flick off the switch if he wants to. And then remind yourself, he doesn't owe any of us an explanation about anything, purely because of who he is. We have neither the vantage point to really understand the universe like he does, nor the strength to challenge him. Now, this is not to minimize all of our pain in the midst of suffering, of course. Of course, that's not the point. Of course, that's not the point. But if we can say with Job, now my eyes have seen you when life is at its most difficult, I can guarantee you that that will transform your relationship with God because you will have just put him in his proper place in your mind. You will have put him on the shelf in your mind that only God can sit in sit on rather than the shelf that every other human sits on. And with Job, we may have to repent at that point and say, surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. I was chatting about this passage earlier in the week with some of the ministry team, and somebody said, I'm off to go and see um, this person and this thing has happened in her life. How would the book of Job help her? And I think the help that it gives is not to make the pain any easier or to answer all of the questions that we might have. Rather, it lifts our eyes to the Lord God to see him for who he really is. The one who is greater than we can imagine. The one who holds the universe together. And the reason that that matters is because then our faith in him will be built on a robust foundation. The foundation that is the fear of the Lord not a foundation that crumbles as soon as life gets difficult or confusing. This is the punch of the book. But it isn't the end of the book. There is a postscript in chapter 42, which we're going to look at very briefly now. As I said, the last thing that happens in the book is that God does restore all of Job's fortunes once again. Have a look at chapter 42, verse 12. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. And he also had seven sons and three daughters. So at the end of the story, Job ends up with double the number of sheep, camels, oxen, and donkeys that he started with. His latter days are twice as blessed as his former days before the calamity. And a whole new family are given to him, sons and daughters, the most beautiful daughters in the East, we're told, and Job lives on to see his children and their children to the fourth generation. And the point isn't to read this and to say, well, that makes it all okay then in the end, doesn't it? Because it doesn't. For a start, you can't replace one dead child with another one and say, that's fine. Nor is the point to say that if life gets hard, well, don't worry, because God will sort it out a little further down the line and you'll get all your stuff back and live to a good old age. This isn't being given as a template for how life will go for everybody. You might end your days in ashes. But it is a picture of what God is like. He does know what he's doing. There is a happy ending. Certainly he is working out purposes that are far beyond our understanding. But nobody is more committed to life and goodness and blessing than he is. He's the author of it all, after all. And it's fascinating when we read Job as a kind of commentary on the Bible as a whole, which I suspect was intentional, although I can't prove it. Job's life is almost like a microcosm of the story of the world as a whole through the Bible as we read it. It goes confusingly wrong and questions abound, but it will all end up in the right place in the end. And in the middle, we are invited to trust and more importantly, fear God, the one who is orchestrating the whole thing, the fear of the Lord. Well, that is wisdom. One of the places as we get into the New Testament when this becomes most profound is right at the heart of the gospel narrative. We touched on this a couple of weeks ago, but let's flesh it out a little bit more to finish with. And it comes in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus is facing the prospect of going to the cross. And he's faced with a Job-like dilemma. 
On the one hand, he can't quite bring himself to go through with this plan that God has set forth. Jesus, who's never faltered even for a step at any point, sweats drops of blood and he says to the Father, if possible, may this cup be taken away from me. But on the other hand, he trusts his heavenly Father. He fears the Lord God, his Father, and he assumes that God knows what's best. And so he says, yet not my will, but yours be done. There's the Job-like dilemma. And I don't think after Jesus is raised from the dead, we're supposed to say, well, that makes it all okay then. There wasn't really anything to it. We still have profoundly difficult questions, even about Jesus' death on the cross, that can't be tied up neatly in a theological seminary. But the point is that when the disciples find the empty tomb, they realize that God had much greater purposes in all of this that they could hardly get their heads around. And that's why the fear of the Lord is wisdom, and to turn away from evil is understanding. Why don't we pray to finish?